Hello and welcome to the Tekken Sports Podcast. Tekken Sports is a show about how technology is revolutionizing all of the major sports as well as health and fitness. You can find it on your podcast service of choice. My name is Alex Radu and I'm here with the one and only Mandy Kovacs. Hello. This week we discuss how voice assistants like Alexa and Google Assistant could change healthcare systems for the better, plus all of the biggest news from the last week, new apps or wearables, and your weekly concussion update. But before we get to that, we would really appreciate it if you would review and rate the Tekken Sports Podcast on iTunes and Google Play or wherever else you get your podcasts from. It really does help us grow the show and we really, really appreciate all the support so far. And with that, sit back and relax because the Tekken Sports crew is entering the game. All right, Mandy, the news. All right. So first up is news that the NFL, in conjunction with the NFL Players Association, has banned players wearing at least 10 models of helmets that performed poorly in lab testing about impact absorption. So in every locker room, when these players return for their off-season training in a couple of weeks, there's going to be a new poster on the wall ranking 34 different helmets according to their ability to reduce the forces that can lead to concussions based on lab tests. So like I said, 10 helmets have been banned. Six of those can't be worn starting starting this season, but the other four are being phased out slowly, and so they can still be used this year by players who wore them in 2017, but not by any new players. And so apparently this ban will affect more than 200 players who have been wearing these now-banned helmet models, uh, most notably Tom Brady and Drew Brees. However, they both use one of the four helmets that can still be worn by players who used it last year, Uh, so it'll be up to them to look at the science and see if they want to switch to a newer model this year. Or take advantage of the loophole that the NFL has left for them until they're absolutely forced to switch, which I'm assuming is 2019. And so this is the first time the league is prohibiting certain helmets, which is a really good uh, first step for player safety in our humble opinion, uh, because the NFL has said that there was a 16% rise in diagnosed concussions in the NFL from 2016 to 2017. So this comes at the right time. That's a great first step. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, I don't, it's almost an obvious first step yeah. is to ban helmets that aren't as safe as others it's true it's as simple as that yeah i, I would love to see like the uh because i bet there are statistics out there mm. on like how safe each helmet is i think so yeah i'd love to i'd love to really dive into those because that could be interesting that would well. be a really interesting study just to be like oh this one's 30 percent safer or something yeah like that. yeah and it was like specific brands too that had worse rankings which is kind of interesting too so i mean maybe they'll have to go back and rejig their development programs for that yeah i'd almost like to rank the brands and how safe their helmets are maybe we can get our hands on that data yeah. i doubt it but yeah i doubt it too but that, that would be interesting <laughs> that, that would be, be that would cool. be maybe taking too many shots at brands but whatever <laughs> Fair enough. All right, and then we're continuing with the NFL today because they have a lot going on. So apparently the NFL's insurance companies are suing the league over how much they may or may not know about the risks of concussions while playing football. So this is actually a huge story. So the insurers want four former league-affiliated doctors and one current one to turn over documents allegedly in their possession that would apparently prove that the NFL has known about the dangers of head injuries for decades. So the documents the insurers are asking for include medical information and clinical tests, but also all correspondence between the doctors and the leagues around the early 2000s time period. And so if you've seen the movie Concussion with Will Smith, you might recognize that this is when the NFL actually tried to discredit a medical journal on CTE in football by Dr. Bennett (laughs) Omalu. Wow, stuttered over that one. But so far, the NFL has ignored the uh, New York State's judges' subpoenas asking for this. Um, so things could really get dicey. And in case you forgot, the league settled its class action lawsuit from players claiming head injuries out of court last year for more than $2 billion. And so the problem is the NFL is counting on its insurance companies to pay a large part of that $2 billion. But because this deal was struck without anyone actually finding out how much the league knew about the dangers of head injuries, the insurers are now suing the league because if it did know about the risks, that would be fraud and invalidate their contract with the NFL. So this is like this could be a really big problem. Yeah, and so that means that the NFL would then be uh, on the hook for two billion dollars. Yeah, and, and then like they're worth a lot, but not. I don't know if they'd be able to afford that and be okay after. Well, I mean, like I'm sure they could. Just, but like Maybe. my, I think almost the more interesting thing when I look at it here is that it looks like this would prove whether or not uh, the NFL knew or not, mm-hmm. and that, that opens it up to entirely new lawsuits Absolutely. from players mm-hmm. and teams etc like it could 
really open that up. <laughs> yeah, and those <laughs> won't be accepting lot. just two billion dollars, which yeah. like seems like a lot, but it could go way higher than yeah, that. Yeah, like that could be like a moment where it's like, oh, we might not settle. <laughs> Absolutely, right? <laughs> so it, it it could be really it could be really interesting to see where this goes. Um, and and you and I have talked about this off the air, but also what happens to team at the leagues like the NHL? Yeah, who knows if this true. goes really bad for them? I mean, it's obviously not going to be on as big of a scale mm-hmm. uh, as the NFL because it's just a smaller league. But hey, NHL. Keep your, I mean, I'm sure they are keeping their eyes on this, but you're next. <laughs> it's true. And think of how high the insurance premiums would go up, too, mm-hmm. if they did lose this. Or, I mean, would Evan, would anyone even want to partner with them mm-hmm. in the first place, right? Because that's a lot of liability and damages that they would need to pay for yeah. on behalf of the NFL or whatever league it is. Yeah, no. So that's just my messaging. Yeah. Hey, NHL, look out. You're next. <laughs> Watch out. And now, leaving the world of concussions for a bit, we have news that Elliot keep. Kipchoge, so I'm sorry I'm butchering that again. He's actually the fastest marathon runner in the world. He wore 3D printed Nike Nike shoes at the 2018 London Marathon on April 22nd. So we recorded this before the marathon finished, unfortunately, so we don't know if he won. Um, but it's really cool to see the fastest marathon or fer- marathon runner in the world getting on board with tech. He's actually come the closest to running a, a sub two hour marathon, which is pretty incredible. He only missed it by 25 seconds. Uh, and so for this marathon, he wore Nike's fly print shoes, which has an entirely 3D printed upper portion made of polyurethane material that can be printed in less than 30 minutes. And it retails for almost 900 dollars Canadian so it's not cheap Uh, and so each thread in this shoe is less than a millimeter thick and it can span the entire length of the shoe uh, which makes it a little bit easier to control specific things like length curvature and diameter they're highly customizable and are actually 11 grams lighter than Nike's previous shoe designed for marathon runners which is called the Zoom Vaporfly Elite what's really interesting about this is that the, the printing time 30 minutes yeah that means that like you can start getting like super customizable shoes really like i mean it's going to hopefully become more affordable and stuff like that (laughs) right but that's going to do a lot for athletes in all sports that wear shoes (laughs) i mean right like think about it like you could even just set up a 3d printer at this marathon and people would just come early to print their shoes if it was more affordable yeah right but like that could be a cool service offered by some of these companies or it could be even like a uh uh, kind of just for fans. It's like, hey, you yeah. see the shoes that they're they're wearing right now? <laughs> want you can, one? You, you want one? You can watch it be printed right now. Or they maybe already have some printed yeah. and it's just a demonstration, but that could be really cool. Yeah, really interesting marketing opportunity there. You're welcome, Nike. Yeah, there you go. We should get paid. Uh, and then another story from Nike, actually. The sports apparel giant has acquired an Israeli computer vision company called Invertex as a way to bolster its digital technology platform. So Invertex apparently leverages 3D scanning to allow a customer specific e-commerce experience and can create mass customized product lines. So it's essentially an online fitting platform that uses AI to analyze a user's feet and then suggest different shoe models and sizes for best fits. A lot of customization there. And I think that's really where the 3D market is going. So pretty interesting stuff. And then now we're going to go into some streaming news. So Amazon has bought exclusive rights to broadcast the U.S. Open tennis tournament in the U.K. in a deal reportedly worth around $40 million. So U.K. customers with Amazon Prime accounts will be able to watch all of the matches of the tournament, uh, which happens annually in New York every summer. It's one of the four uh, tennis Grand Slam events. So this is a pretty big deal. And continuing with Amazon, too, they are also reportedly in talks to secure a deal with the English Premier League to to stream matches starting in 2019 as well. Although this hasn't been confirmed yet, so maybe stay tuned. Uh, The company did reveal for the first time ever that uh, Amazon Prime has 100 million subscribers, which is really not that far off from Netflix, which boasts around 125 million worldwide, uh, but has been around for a lot longer. So this is pretty big news for Amazon. Yeah, no, this is cool. And I, I mean, I, I keep having conversations lately about all these, you know, streaming things. Mm-hmm. And uh, I I mean, like, this is just going to be the nature of the beast. The next time the NFL uh, broadcasting rights are up, the NBA, et cetera, Amazon, Facebook, mm-hmm. Twitter, they're all going to be bidding for them alongside all your traditional places as well. Yeah, they're all in it. Um, And to, like, like, like you said, you, everyone, like, I already have Prime. For instance, mm-hmm. if Amazon does this and I live in the UK or if they make a deal with the uh, EPL, 
I can just start using it because I have Prime. I didn't buy Prime for this, but <laughs> I, I, I mean, like, it's just an awesome added addition. Yeah, so, well, exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. So, like, an Amazon's really going to benefit from the fact that, unlike Netflix, where people are going to Netflix and buying Netflix for TV and movies, mm-hmm. um, Amazon, people are going it because you get free shipping. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> and so, and stuff like that. So and you just happen to get really cool that, TV. <laughs> exa- yeah, you, hap- you happen to get a bunch of other movies and TV and Prime Video and w- yeah. all this stuff there. So, this is just going to be stuff like that, and it's going to be really cool. Yeah, it's a little extra bonus. Bonus. And then, so continuing with some streaming news, so the Blue Jays' first Wednesday game streamed exclusively on Facebook happened last week uh, against the Kansas City Royals, who they killed th- uh, 15-5. And so I just wanted to rant about this a little bit because, so I was watching it. Um, I was actually on the beach in the Bahamas. Uh, I was there for a work event, but I wasn't actually working at this time. I'm not going to lie. Um, and so I thought the stream was great. There was like a minor little technical glitch, whatever. Uh, but all of the, the visuals were great. There were no commercials. There was a lot of really cool extra content in between innings because there were no commercials um, so like they did um, a breakdown of how many injuries Troy Tulowitzki had and they basically just mapped out every single how he's broken almost every single part of his body and it was just really cool stuff like that that you probably wouldn't ever really see on Sportsnet or, or wherever else wherever you are where you happen to watch um, baseball games but the worst part was the people commenting on this thing <laughs> that they were they were complaining that they pay really expensive cable bills and you know they couldn't watch this on TV and it was super frustrating to them and I just it made me so angry like I know like I could have full screened it I could have ignored the comments but I'm one of those weird like masochistic people that I had to read them and it just made me angrier and angrier and angrier <laughs> because I mean like expensive cable bills are not the MLB's problem it's not Facebook's problem it's no one's problem except for your own. And like we just said, like things are going towards streaming on sites anyways, right? It doesn't make sense. It's silly. I think people need to kind of get over themselves a little bit. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think that's what's interesting when you talk about these conversations about it is that because right now to watch sports, you kind of do still need cable mm-hmm. for the most part because it's like, yeah, this is one Blue Jays game. Right. Um, and I, what's interesting too, the Facebook stuff is with all the Facebook news, I've had people talk to me and they're like, hey, yeah. uh, what if I don't want to use Facebook? And I'm like, okay, well, what if you don't want to use ESPN? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> I mean, and like, we know, we've talked about it. It's not that hard to make a like a r- Facebook account that you just use for streaming well yeah everyone has a facebook account yeah or just use your like come on like you're already using facebook right and the fact that these people were actually on the stream and they were able to comment on facebook like clearly it was working for them like they just wanted to complain for the sake of complaining you can easily throw your screen up on a tv like i think most tvs can do that most tvs are smart nowadays if not a cable is like twenty dollars like it just it, it was kind of frustrating to watch so many people freak out about that when it wasn't a big deal yeah, I mean, like, I, I totally get it if the stream sucks and stuff like mm-hmm. that. But, like, here's the thing, too, is that more and more when you buy TVs, they have internet uh, connectivity. Or, yeah. you know, you have a Google Chromecast or whatever. Like, if you're cutting the cord, you're setting up your whole media station to be able to, you know, stream on your TV. Mm-hmm. So being able to do that on Facebook's not going to be that hard of a reach because as they do this more and more, they're only going to make it easier, too. Oh, exactly. Like, right now, you also have to think about it. If you were watching facebook's mlb things you are also technically beta testing it like Mm -hmm. you are testing it out like this is the first time they're doing it if it's if it's not good Mm -hmm. hopefully they take your feedback but you are testing it and you kind of have to look at it as you are testing it and it's going to have problems yeah but it'll obviously get better too right like that's the nature of the platform yeah so i mean right now i think it's just interesting because i mean honestly you still find those people who are like oh well why is it on facebook and then they're Mm -hmm. also complaining about why are ratings down and all that because it's like well okay well they need to try things to get people to watch baseball yeah (laughs) and like this made it so much more accessible like i said like i was in the bahamas watching it you know during a break in in a conference that i was covering and some of the comments were you know people from like croatia being like oh i'm watching it at 2 a.m and Croatia and whatever or some person saying oh I'm watching it in Russia like that's really cool like it it expands the footprint that the MLB has and we've talked about it before the MLB's numbers are dropping quite significantly and it's a lot of older age people watching so this is a perfect way to get some of the younger generation to actually watch games I I I totally agree yeah all right well that's it for the news today sorry about my rant that wasn't exactly news but you know moving on uh we're gonna go to new apps and wearables now all right so yeah for our wearable and apps section today we're gonna i'm gonna start off with the topic that i just really like uh so right now the nba fans or just nba fans in general you guys have seen this a lot but uh uh philadelphia 76ers superstar joel Embiid, he hurt his face and now he has a mask (laughs) 
Um, so that mask ended up being a pretty high tech concoction. And uh, Sports Illustrated and the great Ramona Shelburne over at ESPN, uh, they both detailed it after uh, the game last their first game back or his first big game back against the Heat in Game Three last week. So the mask is made up of a pro comp material, which is a combination of polypropylene and embedded carbon fiber filaments that make it literally virtually indestructible. Like Batman. Yeah, it really <laughs> does make him look like Batman. It was designed by John Horn, a proto synth prothesist or something it's uh, that's a Pros- word prosthetic Proths- no that's not the word it's whatever the scientist version of it is <laughs> i can't honestly pronounce it and we I'm, are professionals I'm very professional i've tried numerous times <laughs> uh at the university of delaware star campus horn specializes in research and clinical prosthetic and orthotic devices the mask also has an additional set of goggles but the technology behind it is a secret for some reason i oh don't know boy. why it's a secret <laughs> That's all that, but that it really is Batman. <laughs> it, it looks really cool. It, yeah, it does. Slightly um, scary, but cool. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, he is a seven foot tall dude who's wearing a mask. He could be Batman. That's fair. Um, ultimately, this whole process is a large undertaking for Embiid and the Sixers. It took almost two dozen iterations and retooling for the NBA to approve the mask, and everything is licensed with the league. Uh, but without the mask, Embiid could experience a great risk of re-injury, and that could lead to a potential loss of sight in his left eye. So I definitely say the wait is was worth it for him. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I just wanted to talk about this cool little tech. I mean, obviously this isn't something we're going to be able to get mm-hmm. um, just off the street, but it is cool to see this this piece of tech that has been really gaining a lot of mainstream attention yeah. lately because it really does make him look like Batman. Have we ever <laughs> seen like a hockey player or a baseball player or a football player wearing masks like this? Why is it only in basketball? Um, well, I guess they're all wearing helmets, though, right? Yeah, but like they only have the partial visors now, though. Yeah, but in, in hockey, in hockey, when you look at the whenever they have facial things, though, they wear like the the youth like chain. Uh, the cage. The cage. Yeah, the, the cage. <laughs> Do they even wear those on the ice anymore? Yeah, I've, though? Se- I've seen them. Yeah. yeah, it's whenever someone suffers like a like. Let's say they got like hit with a puck in the face and it like broke, broke something or they broke their nose or something. They always wear those. That's as true. Protection. Well, I would like to see these masks as well. I agree. I think that would Although, look badass. I think it would. I think it would be really hard to play those other sports in those. Oh, masks totally. Because like it revolves <laughs> like looking at a much smaller target. Like mm-hmm. with basketball, like yeah, your range of motion is still not great, mm-hmm. and his eyesight's definitely limited. But at least they're not but, also wearing helmets. But they're not also yeah. He's not also wearing a helmet. <laughs> and like a bunch of other equipment like that is the to a, other than his jersey and his yeah. like clothes <laughs> that yeah is, hockey player would have so many blind spots exactly like just the <laughs> blind spots that i don't think it would be realistic <laughs> that's funny but it would be intimidating though it would be really sc- maybe it would scare away the opponents i mean we'll see i don't think that's how athletes are built but <laughs> no i don't think so either this is just me thinking out loud <laughs> yeah all right so uh intel uh, our next story intel is reportedly closing its new devices group that focuses on wearables like smart glasses and fitness trackers while the company has put several hundred million dollars, hundred million dollars into this division, it clearly never made much of a dent in the market. Um, so, like Intel handled its failed attempt at streaming TV. Word is that they are going to just leave the wearables market altogether. So, the most popular wearable came in the company's team up with Oakley for smart premium luxury and sports eyewear. Although I can't personally say that I remember too much Intel content <laughs> in, no. the, in this department. So. Um, I, I, I do get how they didn't make a dent. Yep, that makes um, a little bit more sense. But uh, as of February, this wearables division was valued at $350 million and had around 200 people working in it. However, what? that is a steep decline from the 800-person crew that was reported in 2016. Huh. So this is obviously sad news, and uh, good luck to all those pe- uh, good people working in this division on their next endeavors if this indeed does lead to layoffs. Yeah, that's kind of sad. Yeah. I mean, like, it sucks to see people, like, or another big company kind of just pull out of this Mm -hmm. clearly possible uh, market. Right. But, I mean, hey, if they couldn't get it to work, if they couldn't persuade themselves to do it, then, I mean, we'll let all the other really cool startups that are doing it. Because I think that's really going to be what propels the wearables market is going to be cool startups. Because that's what we've seen so far. Yeah, but it's interesting, though, that we're seeing so much consolidation and so many companies dropping out of it so early on. Right. Like we've talked about how fast the wearables market is going to grow in the next five years. And it kind of seems like all of them are dropping out a little early. Well, I mean, I think what's what's happening, though, is it's um, they're dropping out of very specific stuff. Like when we talk about those older reports uh, from a few weeks ago, it was like smart clothing and stuff like that. True. When you look at smart glasses, there really wasn't a market for it. Like that just never really panned out. Um, And then smart watches. It's just stuff like the Apple Watch and uh 
Fitbits, like they're just dominating so much. Yeah, like they you might have just the established little, leaders. Yeah, but like it, it is like more established and like they have like seventy percent of the market. Right, but I mean, there's so. always room to take market share away from them, though. I guess. I mean, hey, I don't disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, and, and you know, Intel's allowed to do with their yeah, money whatever they true. want. I'm just saying, don't give up, guys. You can do it. <laughs> you can take away market share from Apple. Yeah. All right. So our uh, for our last story, uh, we talk about streaming services all the time and how nearly every sport is making making some effort to put its broadcasts online, uh, but it can often be a pain to find out where. So enter Bleacher Report Live, an app that we've actually talked before on this pod, and that will begin listing where games are being streamed. So this is going to be really similar to how when you look at websites like NBA.com for scores, you see where they are being broadcasted. It's honestly that simple, and the app will even direct you to the nearest bar where that game might be playing if you don't actually own that streaming service. So it's a, yeah, it's just kind of a a handy PSA if you don't know where, hey, where's the Jays being played, Uh, the game being played. Oh, it's on Facebook. Cool. Thanks, Bleacher. Yeah, cool. I like it. Yeah. So uh, that's it for apps and wearables this week. So now on to concussions. Every day, a large portion of athletes with a history of repetitive head trauma are battling with a progressive neurodegenerative brain disease called CTE. Symptoms of CTE include blurred vision, dementia, depression, headaches, memory loss, and mood swings. There is no cure, and it only gets worse with time. This is the number one issue in sports, so every week we'll be updating you on what is happening in the world of concussion prevention. So I do like to think that what we do here with concussions is a PSA for taking concussions seriously, not just in sports, but in your daily life as well. And, um, well, sometimes that comes in the form of scary as hell studies. <laughs> yeah, this is a little terrifying. <laughs> um, I mean, it's not as bad as it may sound, but it is. It, here, let's, let's get right into it. So this study comes from the University of California, San Francisco, and was published in the journal Neurology that has a big takeaway that suggests that a single traumatic brain injury, or TBI, even a mild one, can significantly increase the risk of developing Parkinson's disease. TBIs, including mild ones, most often come in the form of concussions. Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative disorder that disrupts the nervous system and affects motor control. The underlying causes of it are still pretty much unknown, although there is research that points to some genetic factors, and it is supposedly more common in men, and the likelihood does increase with age. So this is a particularly scary because the study found that while the increased risk depended on how severe the brain injury was, apparently even a mild brain injury raised the likelihood of Parkinson's by as much as 56%. Want to make that even scarier, supposedly 42 million people worldwide are believed to have to have sustained a concussion each year. But here's the positive spin. This research from the UCSF team was gathered by studying the 12-year health records of 325,870 American military veterans between the ages of 31 to 65, whose health info was in the U.S. Veterans Health Administration databases. And so they defined a mild TBI as a loss of consciousness lasting from 0 to 30 minutes, a moment of altered consciousness within 24 hours after the injury, or a temporary amnesia lasting from 0 to 24 hours after injury. Anything worse uh, would then be a moderate to, to, to severe TBI. So it's important to look at the number of patients in this study because uh, while, well, yes, that number of 56% does increase, in reality, the absolute risk of developing Parkinson's only jumps up from a 0.2% to 0.3% between uninjured and injured individuals. So really, it's only a 0.1% increase for those who are injured, which is still a really low number. Um, Plus, we do have to look at the fact that this study just looked at military veterans who, by nature of being a military veteran, are more likely to sustain this injury. So we should just look at the stat through the lens of being military vets, but it isn't unreasonable to say that future studies could find correlations with the general public. So the point of all this is, even if it's a tiny percentage, concussions are bad. (laughs) Yeah, really. (laughs) They are scary. Uh, We need to protect ourselves from getting them. And if we do get them, we do need to find better ways to find treatment for it. Right. Well, I mean, I think the scariest part, too, is that even just like a a small single brain injury can increase this. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it is only 0.1 percent. But what happens when you get two, three, four, five or even a severe concussion, one or two in your lifetime? Right. Like how Mm -hmm. many more points does it jump up because of those? Yeah. I mean, I like to also look at it as like it's just another thing of like, hey, concussions really are not as simple as like, oh, you know. Your head hurts. Well, exactly. Yeah, or I, I just don't remember <laughs> yeah. what happened. You know, yeah. when I got hit. <laughs> yeah, like when your when your nights are when your lights are locked are knocked out. You know, like right. that's not good. Mm-hmm. You know, and it and it actually has long term. Uh, you know, 
problems that we still are figuring out because we i guess we when you look at concussion history you do have to remember the fact that this is all like relatively new study Mm -hmm. this is all like research and all this has been happening but like people have always really started taking it seriously because sports have started to in the last what decade not even like five years maybe yeah so i mean we're really trying we're all really still figuring out what concussions are going to do but it all starts somewhere, and uh, I mean, hey, I, it is also important to remember this is military vets. Yeah. And by the nature of being a military vet, you are more likely to have a head injury, um, plus a ton of other stuff. Yes, <laughs> so, absolutely. So, but it is like something that we can then maybe correlate with the general public. So we're definitely going to keep an eye on this mm-hmm. this study. All right, that was it for our uh, concussion discussion. Today, we're going to move on to our little debate topic. Uh, And so we're going to talk about healthcare this week again. Um, So we're based in Canada, where we have universal healthcare. And while our wait times to see doctors, specialists, and emergency room doctors are absolutely abysmal, uh, most Canadians are happy with their quality of care once they finally access this. Um, But so one doctor is making a case for voice technology as a way of making the healthcare system even better. So Dr. Terry Fisher, he's also the host of the podcast Alexa in Canada, uh, which you should all go check out because it's amazing. Uh, So he's saying that AI voice first personal assistants like Apple Siri or Google Assistant or even Microsoft's Cortana could improve access to healthcare by allowing users to simply speak to their voice assistant if something is bothering them. So he's saying that it wouldn't obviously replace hospitals or doctors altogether, but it would be more of like a first step before going to them, uh, to either the doctor or to the emergency room, uh, because you could, the personal assistant would know your general medical history, what medications you take, what allergies you have, and who your healthcare providers are. And it could ask you a few questions and how to obtain the right healthcare for your current situation. So this first step could potentially save the healthcare system financially and maybe even weed out some of the not so serious cases that might clog up the system. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on this, Alex? Because, I mean, we both have Amazon Alexas, so, I mean, we've gotten used to the idea of virtual assistants, but not everybody has, and they're not for everyone, so... Yeah, I mean, I have uh, both a Google Home oh, and yeah. a uh, uh, an Echo. So, I, I mean, I... I set up reminders on my Google assistant <laughs> all the time. So I am basically married to it now. Um, but I, I do agree. I think first off, this is going to save just awesome, like a huge amounts of mm-hmm. money, which is a, which is a cool thing. Um, but for me, this kind of idea goes back to show that we always talk about the real application and when all these wearables and stuff like that, this, these health devices are really going to take off is because of healthcare. Mm-hmm. It's going to be because like, you can be like, oh, hey, if I wear this wristwatch, I can potentially save myself from having a heart attack because it is c- keeping track constantly of my my heart rate mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Um, and I think that uh, you look at a ton of medical startups who are in healthcare, you know, startups, tech startups who are working in this industry. I think they tef- they definitely see this as a possibility. They have to. Yeah. Right? Like whether it's an, <laughs> yeah, whether it's an Alexa skill or mm-hmm. something that can be like, hey. You, we know your uh, your medical history. He, what are your symptoms? Okay, mm-hmm. so those symptoms could link to this, this, this. You know, maybe here's a percentage of how severe or how much you should get to, uh, how much you should go to a doctor or something like that. True. Granted, I, I don't know if that type of angle might be worth it because that then puts way too much in the hands <laughs> of this. Because if it's wrong and you don't go and then you die, then that <laughs> opens up that company to lawsuits. <laughs> That's true. So it, it is definitely going to have to be something that potentially that uh, they're going to have to pretty much nail down how legal legally it would it would it would be. Right. And yeah, so like I was having this discussion with someone at work uh, quite a few months ago, actually. We just bought my grandmother one of, you know, those life alert, like tag things that they can wear as a necklace around their neck. And it's supposed to sense when they fall and alert people um, or the company or whoever you need it to. Um, and so this guy at work that I was talking to was saying that he actually installed Alexa in his mother's house, who was kind of getting older and she tends to fall a lot. And so that when she never she falls, um, she just tells Alexa to call him and he can go over and help her as kind of like an alternative to buying those life alert things because those are really expensive. It was like $500 and I think you have to pay a certain amount every month to keep it connected um, to a phone system if you don't have Wi-Fi. So you would need to have Alexa and Wi-Fi in order for that to work, but it is a much cheaper option, right? Because an Echo Dot is only like $60 in Canada or like 50 in the US or whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. So like it would be kind of that alternative option. 
No, I agree. Uh, unless it, you fall and pass out, then you yeah, kind of I run mean, into issues. Yeah, in that case, for sure, then it's already <laughs> past Alexa. That's true. Um, but I think I think you you actually hit the nail on the head there with uh, making like voice commands are going to be easier to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, I see my grandma on like this tiny, like honestly, like seven, eight year old uh, tablet, <laughs> um, and she's always using voice commands to like search Google. That's cool. Like she doesn't, I, I guess she doesn't like typing as that much. Mm-hmm. So she just uses a voice command to search it and like all the time. Yeah. So I think this would be uh, like a really cool, uh, like a way for, you know, to, for every generation to use mm-hmm. and to adapt. And also just like, imagine if you have like, um, a cold or something like that. And you're like, Oh, is this, is this a flu or is this just the cold? How do I, <laughs> <laughs> and, or like, you know, you can, mm-hmm. it'd be cool. My only question is, though, is what Alexa would use to actually Google these symptoms? Because, like, if she's going on WebMD, like, I feel like everything you put into that, it's like, oh, you might actually be dying of this disease or or this infection. So, I mean, if she's using that kind of web based thing or using actual more medical based things we don't know i mean obviously this is still quite far into the future but it would depend on the resources that she's tapping into i guess yeah i mean when i look at it it's more of um this would be an alexa skill so it would be someone using the alexa resources and then you'd install that skill onto your onto the onto your alexa app like a dedicated app yeah and then Mm -hmm. that's well it would I mean, it's just the skill on the Alexa app. Yeah. But you would, um, that, that skill, that company would be then tapped into, let's say like a, uh, hospital database or like a Canadian health records database. Or right. Something like, like a that. more professional resource. Yeah. And it would like, okay. like, so it wouldn't just be like searching the web for whatever. Yeah. It would be tapped into a purely medical, uh, resource. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the possibilities are endless. Yeah. No, definitely. But it's definitely really cool. All right. Awesome. Well, that was it for today's episode. Uh, Thanks to everyone who listened. Just a reminder that we are also now in a daily format. If you'd rather listen to us that way, you can follow us on Twitter at ITB Tech and Sports or on our personal accounts at Mandy V. Kovacs and Alex T. Radu. That was episode 40, which is incredible. Never thought we would get this far. So thanks for listening, everyone. We appreciate it. (laughs) 